Oh, refreshed and relaxed and back in the saddle for a September. We kick the fall off. It is here, and we are here, and thankful to be here. Paul Lyhander with you on this Tuesday morning, in case you forgot to flip the calendar over the weekend. Yeah, we had a little bit of August and a little dash of September, and here we are. Graham Hill back on the ones and twos after a weekend where he's had plenty of concerts and football watching, as did many of you, and so... We take a big, deep bow and get ready for what could be the most crucial start to a college football season ever for NC State. Why? Because the ACC, as they say, is zupa wide open. Florida State last night laid the egg at home against Boston College. How many of you? Had Bill O'Brien on your bingo card thinking the Boston College would be the one of the top four teams in the ACC after week one. I know Graham Hill did. Man, do I need to start trusting my heart. And I'm not trying to say I'm going to sit here and call that Boston College is going to upstate or upset Florida State last night. It upset me that I didn't think about how close they played last season. Took Florida State to the wire in overtime. And, you know, I, I kind of zig when everybody else was zigging instead of zagging and bought into the hype of, yeah, there's no way after losing week one to or week zero to Georgia Tech that Florida State could lose their home opener, right? Right? 17 and a half point favorite? Come on. Now. It's easy money. This is overreaction Tuesday, right? This is where we are. Uh, the ACC has been upended. With Clemson getting routed by Georgia, and I don't take that too lightly, but I also put that in perspective as my Oregon Ducks got beat up by Georgia in that same venue two years ago. But Clemson did not look like a team that was picked to finish in the ACC championship game. Georgia looks every bit the part, certainly in the SEC. But with Florida State and Clemson now not doing so hot, and Virginia Tech getting beat by, of all teams, Vanderbilt. Yep. Oh, my God. Who doesn't even have an end zone in their stadium for their fans to sit in. And that was the SEC's big signature win over the weekend. That was their big signature win. UNC and State kind of do the winning thing for sure. Duke plays a ton of defense against an Elon team. But say hi to Boston College and say hello to Georgia Tech. What do do those two teams have in common that others do not? They have running quarterbacks, which is going to create havoc, apparently, in the ACC when it comes to defense. Castellanos and Haynes King, Castellanos at Boston College, Haynes King at Georgia Tech, those guys ran like crazy. A team that NC State had trouble with in a running quarterback, which was Western Carolina, in which it took them three quarters to get things started. They won't have that opportunity coming up this weekend at Tennessee. Let's start at the top right away with Florida State. Florida State clearly on the struggle bus. DJ, you coming back to the ACC, probably should have stayed in the Pac-2 at Oregon State where he had plenty of runway and um, a little bit lighter of a conference schedule. Mike Norvell talked about owning the early season struggle. There's going to be plenty of negativity around this program. I understand that. I mean, when you perform the way we, you know, the way we just did, you know, that's all. That's all part of it. Uh, but for a football team, you know, you got to stay together and you got to make sure that uh, you, you're there for each other. You know, we've been knocked down. Um, you, you know, get we, up again. You know, we know how to get up, but we've got to go do that. And you know, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to put it into action and then to be able to perform in the moment. You know, throughout the course of a game. Um, But uh, I do believe in this team, and I believe in what we can do, and I believe in how we can respond. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of work to be done because that that does not look like Florida State football with what we just did. Clearly did not look like Florida State football at any point in that game. And this was a coach that went out at halftime as Boston College went to the locker room. He pulled his players out to the 50 and – I'm no great lip reader by what but what it means, but I can read I can read lips to a certain point. And he said, We are going to win this football game. He said it to every one of those players on his team. We are going to win this football game. And then he took them back into the locker room and he did his halftime uh, spiel with uh I think it was Holly I can't remember maybe it was Holly Rowe, I can't remember who it was on the sideline. 
And they were like, yeah, we need to get out, execute, whatnot. But he told his team, we are going to win this football game. They did not. I mean, you know it's bad when the team is meeting on the field at halftime before you can even get into the locker room. You also know it's bad when Florida State on their first three possessions, all three and outs, pretty much touched the ball once the entire first quarter. Boston College is absolutely dominating all aspects of this game, from time and possessions to rushing yards to passing yards, and then just looking like, they are a much better football team than what is supposed to be the 10th-ranked team in the country right now in college football. That's Graham Hill. Paul Lyhander here. Next up, 99.9 The Fan, your little palate cleanser of the day. Is, you know, we will talk NFL today, but you know there was a lot that happened in college football over the weekend. At, at one point during that game, Graham, the crowd at FSU in Tallahassee at home. This is where I'm not a big fan of calling out players, but fan bases do this. They were chanting, we want Brock. We want Brock, as in Brock Glenn, the redshirt freshman who played in the bowl game last year. (laughs) Who played in the bowl game after Jordan Travis went down. They were chanting, we want Brock, because they weren't getting it done on offense. Is that part DJU's fault? Probably. Is it part the rest of that offensive line's fault? That offensive line that's supposed to be creating monster holes because it's like every returner ever back chiseled in stone like... The returners literally played in the 1940s in leather helmets. I'm exaggerating, but it is an overreaction week. That is the state of Florida State football right now. That is where they're at. If you had Florida State and Clemson at the top of the top of the leaderboard when it came to the ACC, good for you. Still believe in that. It's okay to believe in that. But it shouldn't surprise you that the power balance of college football right now has shifted to South Beach, where Miami is right on top as they dispatch Florida in that first game. Now, Miami's big test doesn't come for a little while. They're playing Florida A&M this Saturday, in which the big loss will be at halftime because the Florida A&M stealing this from a colleague. Basically, the Rattlers band at Florida A&M will, will get the dub at halftime for sure. And maybe they'll surprise somebody, but let's, let's be honest. Miami's a very good football team right now. Very talented. They did well in the portal. They did everything they needed to do, and Cam Ward looked fan-freaking-tastic. But if you would have thought that we're now dealing with quarterback situations at North Carolina, we don't have one at Syracuse, and they've got a big test coming up this weekend at, at, uh, with Georgia Tech. And NC State, who struggled but still got a win and still managed to make people unhappy in a win, how do you make a fan base unhappy in a win? Get started slowly. Can't do that this weekend. Graham Hill's going to be there. Dave Doran's going to be there. And he knows there's a monster jump from week one to week two. It can be big. You know, I think that's a common said thing that, you know, the biggest improvement you have is game one to game two. I, I don't really believe that. I think you can have a huge improvement in every game if the roster takes what we call their one mores personally. You know, what did you just put on tape that you have to correct by the end of the next week? And can you do that? Can 11 guys each have one thing better in their game? And when you take that to heart and all of a sudden you have an 11% improvement, you know, per player, there's a big jump. And you saw that for us in the middle of the season last year. It didn't happen in week one or week two. Dave, my head hurts. So much math. (laughs) So much mathing being mathed. But he knows he's got Tennessee. We know they have Tennessee. Tennessee who rolled. Rolled this past weekend against Chattanooga. 69-3. 69-3. to three. Roll, steamroll, <laughs> roll over, whatever it needs to be. Whatever it needs to be for Tennessee, where they got to play. Every, everybody got to play, right? You get to play. You get to play. Nico Imaleva, 314 yards, school record. Again, this was Chattanooga. Let's not overreact like crazy. It was a team that was not built to take on Tennessee. But now they come rolling together with NC State in a wide-open, Zupa wide-open ACC as I started this program. Dave Dorn, Tennessee, opponent this week, Saturday. What do you think? Obviously, we're playing against a way different opponent this week. You know, the the skill level, the scheme, their success, their, all those things. And so, naturally, you think you got to get 100 times better. You don't. You need to play 11-man football, and we need to do that how many plays in a row? You know, can we play together and improve uh, 1% every player on the field in a certain area, fundamentals, technique, 
focus, whatever that thing may be. I discipline each player has got an area of his game that he knows coming out of our grading session with them. This is an area I got to fix. He didn't say anything specific about Tennessee players, which I'm okay with. When you route a team 69 to three, everybody dominates, right? Yeah. Everybody, everybody gets a touch. Everybody gets a catch. You do what you need to do, but state will have to come out much crisper, much faster, not rely so much on the defense to get stops, but have that offense get its timing correct, right? Week one, week two, Dave Dorn doesn't believe in it. I, I mean, I'm not sure what you can do from week one to week two to make improvements. You know, like the monster leaps and bounds. It's not like watching a, a six-year-old grow into a seven-year-old, right? They, do, they grow like four inches over the summer, and you're like, oh, my God, you're taller all of a sudden. Like, I didn't see that coming. We just bought you all the new school clothes. Doesn't quite happen that way in college football. Certainly not within the NFL. It's pretty rare that you see those kinds of leaps and bounds. But coaches can dial in on on programs. Coaches can dial in on certain skills, on how to maximize his effort. We saw it with Texas A&M and Notre Dame, right? Saturday night, Riley Leonard played within the system. Like, Texas A&M is a defensive team. They, they, Mike Elko's team at Texas A&M is a hell of a football team. There's no doubt about it. They just have no offense. Like, they have zero offense. But their defense really kept Notre Dame in check. But Notre Dame figured out a way to to work within its system. It was a full dink and dunk. Right? Leonard wasn't throwing balls to the end zone on, and didn't have to run as hard as he had to until that fourth quarter when it really meant something. But Notre Dame worked within itself. They tailored their team to what they knew they could do against the Texas a and defense. And that's all credit to preparation. That's all credit to coordinators. I'm interested to see what Tony Gibson can dial up against Tennessee, a much more physical football team. I'm interested to see what Robert and I can do in terms of trying to figure out some of the timing routes and some of the things that his offense was trying to do on Thursday night, that hot Thursday night (laughs) at Carter-Finley, and it was steamy. There's no doubt about it. Team was just a little bit off. Maybe it was the delay. Maybe it was just nerves. Whatever it is, you got a half a half a brand new offense out there on the field, but they're going to have to figure out how to play within themselves and how to dial up the right things at the right times. It took them 45 minutes at home talking about state. It took Tennessee, let me look at the uh let me look at the uh the the recap here real quick. It feels it, like it only took, it like took 30 seconds into yeah, the game. Right. 4 minutes, 11 play, 65-yard drive. And that's the thing. Tennessee is going to score some points. NC State's offense cannot get off to the slow start where they only scored about 21 points or 14 points in the first half like they did against Western Carolina. The over-under right now for this game early on, 59-and-a-half. Very tempting to uh, to look at that as it gets close to the game. But, yeah, Tennessee is going to put up some points. And I'm not going to say that NC State wants to get into a dogfight with the Vols, but they certainly are going to have to match their offensive production and they cannot allow the same mistakes as far as time and cadence and just chemistry and getting off slow to happen this Saturday because if they do, it could get ugly quick in Charlotte. It could. We've got all week to talk about it. Wolfpack Weekly tomorrow night on the fan at 7 o'clock. We'll hear more from Dave Doran throughout the week. I'm sure the good news is, is that everyone's healthy, that that excuse will not be a thing. It will be about how well this coaching staff can get them prepared I'm talking about State again to get ready for the Vols. The Vols did not have a test in week one. It felt like NC State shouldn't have had a test, but they got one, and they took it. They passed, but again, we just talked about a win kind of riling up the fan base and not making them happy. So if I give them anything more than a B-, minus, I think people would be crapping down my throat. Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. Head coach Matt Brown said North Carolina quarterback Max Johnson underwent a second procedure on Monday after suffering a broken right leg in the season opening win against Minnesota. Brown said that Johnson still has two years of eligibility to play if the quarterback takes a medical red shirt. Johnson is expected to make a full recovery. NC State head coach Dave Doran said safety Devin Boykin won't be back until October as he recovers from a knee injury. Boykin tore his ACL before the Pop-Tarts Bowl in December. He finished the 2023 season with three interceptions and 54 tackles. 
Jamari Taylor rushed for 128 yards and two touchdowns and caught a pass to score as North Carolina Central waited out a lengthy halftime thunderstorm before dispatching Alabama State 31-24 in the Orange Blossom Classic at Hard Rock Stadium on Sunday. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. Well, remember, you can take the ferry from uh, the Outer Banks to Chapel Hill, which is where we're going next. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Look at that little callback for all you who watch the old Netflix. Netflix, by the way, had the hot dog eating competition between Kobayashi, uh, t- uh, the uh, Japanese hot dog champ, and uh, Joey Chestnut yesterday. Joey Chestnut had 83 hot dogs. Insane. 83. Beat his own record again. 83. Who eats? I, mean, I had a tough time, like, eating a little square lasagna last night. I was like, oh, man, I'm full. <laughs> I'm like, should I have the extra croissant roll? I look at my wife. She's like, yeah, go ahead, have one. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Like, I felt like I was sitting on the couch. I was like, oh, please let this football game get over. All right, I digress. Paul, I handed her here. That's Graham Hill. So, uh, rough news. Max Johnson uh, injured, of course, for Carolina in that win over Minnesota last week. Underwent a second procedure. Head coach Mac Brown giving us an update on Max. Devastated, and what a tough thing for him. He's a tremendous young man and, and great family and um, playing really, really good in the third quarter after a slow start. and um, Everything's looking great. And then when we went out there, the, the doctors kept looking at his knee, and he said, it's not my knee. And that's why he thought it was the hip, and he just actually broke his leg. And nobody knew it, and he, he couldn't walk when he tried to walk off being tough. And uh, the Minnesota medical staff worked really well with our medical staff to make sure that uh, he was safe. So Max Johnson out now, red shirt. He's going to move forward with this team. Uh, he's going to stay in Minnesota for a couple weeks, apparently, because he had another procedure on Monday, as Graham mentioned, so that's now two. They left a trainer with him, by all reports. He's going to be there. They'll welcome him back, and he still has two seasons to go. So where does that leave Carolina from here? They move away from the transfer, and now you're running it back with the guy that was already in the building, Connor Harrell, of which it was going to be a two-quarterback system, right? Not naming a depth chart. We're not going to do this. We're going to have both guys play. And then Johnson gets the hat tip in the first game because he had already played against SEC competition and had a little bit more strength. So Mac Brown now paints himself back into a new corner here. It's not his fault. It's just what happens. Life gets in the way. Max Johnson gets hurt. Can't predict that. He'll be back. Prayers up for him. I hope he does well, and I hope he's able to come back and run it back. But the guy you didn't talk about, Jacoby Criswell, is now back part of that conversation. So you have Connor Harrell who started last year's bowl game, right? Played in last year's games, played for several seasons. And now he's got Jacoby Criswell, who is, thank goodness, back from Arkansas. I think there is a quick look at the depth chart after Max got hurt and everybody, wait a second, what's what's sitting behind him? Well, the second quarterback in the two-quarterback system. So thankfully we didn't name a starter the entire week because we didn't give him that hope that he was going to have to step in and and save our season because that's what he's going to have to do. He's going to have to save this team's season. Like, is that unfair? I'm not sure it is from where I sit. Like, you were like, this is going to be our guy. It's going to be our guy. And then he wasn't. And now all of a sudden he has to be. And I said last week, and I hated making the comparison, but it turned into it all of a sudden. The Bud Kilmer of the ACC is Mac Brown. And he just lost Paul Walker starting quarterback. Lance Harbor just went down, y'all. Here comes Jonathan Moxon. Connor Harrell. He has to tap him on the head and goes, all right, son, go get me a win. You're my guy. You have to be the guy now. And whether that's fair to him or not, whether he could have been named number one or named number two or whatever it is, now you don't have that. There's no speculation at this point. Now it's like, let's go. Let's make it happen. Chip Lindsey, offensive coordinator, North Carolina. What are the strengths of Connor Hale as your number one quarterback? He is, uh, he's got a big arm. He can throw, I think he can throw the ball down the field. I think he's, uh, Extremely talented from an arm talent standpoint. I think he's a really good athlete. We all under, we all have seen him when he breaks loose in the open. He can really run. 
Uh, he's a smart kid. He'll work extremely hard. The more he plays, the more confidence I think he'll play it with. Um, and I think he's already made a lot of progress in that, in that respect. The Max Johnson injury makes me sick, by the way. Like, when he got hurt, I wanted to throw up. It's very disappointing that, I mean, first things first, yeah, you, you definitely are wishing for the best as it seems like Max Johnson's going to stay in Minneapolis for at least another two weeks, and he's up there with medical staff. Coach Brown said they've probably been uh, overbearing a little bit as far as calling his family members and checking up. So that's the first things first. You hate it for Max Johnson with this injury, but then you also hate you hate it for North Carolina fans that you may will you might you're not going to know the potential or you will never see the full potential that you could have had with Max Johnson with all the questions coming into the season. But all that is besides the point. Right now, it's all about how do you prepare Connor Harrell for UNC Charlotte, for North Carolina Central, for James Madison to open up ACC play against Duke. And the good news is for Chip Lindsay and this coaching staff is that there's plenty of tape on Connor Harrell right now going back to last season with the game he played where he finished things up against Campbell in the second to last game of the regular season and then the bowl game and then not much tape to really base it off of in the Minnesota game only went two for four passing wise for 34 yards but if you're Chip Lindsay you got to start implementing this offense and building into it because it did, to you Paul did it feel like they were kind of hesitant to really release the cannon on Connor Harrell and for Max Johnson too in that game against Minnesota well some of that could have been weather but you know there's I believe they're still trying to figure things out this is the this was the this was the dilemma that they faced by having to go, we've got two guys. And so are we preparing with both? Are both getting the assignments? Are both developing that chemistry? If they were splitting time consistently, if both Max Johnson and Carter Hill were splitting time, that's you know, you're getting half the run, right? That's just what it is. I'm only getting half the time. Well, now it's a full time gig. Did it feel like they were holding back? I suppose. They just they were they relied on that defense. That's a very stout defense, by the way. We've talked about it last week. Jeff Collins' defense can actually keep them in games. And to be honest, let's let's call it what it is. Charlotte, you know, A and T. It's A and T, right? It's not Central. It's A and T. Uh, Central. Central. NC Central. I mean, it's just, they'll give them. I mean, Charlotte played JMU close for the first half of their game. But they were the, missing like ten starters. The or yeah, something. they missed a bunch of starters. But that's at Keenan. They have Central. You know, they have James Madison. It's not a murderer's row leading into conference play. Like, this is how you're going to figure everything out here in the next few games. They're just going to have to figure it out in real time. That's the bit. Like, it is all real time is what it is every year. But you don't necessarily expect your starting quarterback, and he was the starter, Max Johnson, to go down in game one. It sucks for him. It sucks for the young man. Again, I hope he, hope he comes back. Carolinas are going to have to figure it out on the fly here as they lead into this new season. And the win over Minnesota should have been joyous, right? This should have been a celebration. You got a big non-conference win on the road. You showed that you can do a few things, right? Your goals for the season are still intact. Yeah, nothing is yeah, nothing has changed. You just now have a declarative number one. Don't this is the guy. You will ride and die with Connor Harrell. All right, son, go get me a win. You're my guy. That's that's Carolina right now. I hope the timing works out. I hope. They're now with a clear quarterback number one is that quarterbacks make people better. We're going to talk about that in the next segment. It's how you make the team around you better. Like, that's the whole bit. That's the big question is are you able to make the team around you better or you just sit on the struggle bus? Can you get Omari and Hampton more touches? I'm not sure he can have more touches. Like, can he take just direct snaps at this point? I hope you're not getting to that point. And I hope and pray Carolina fans don't jump on Harrell, if he struggles early on, because it's unfair to him. He wasn't getting all the reps. You're asking him to do something he wasn't getting prepared for. They were getting him ready to do things, but he didn't get the start in the first game, and that should tell you right away where they felt about him. So you're going to have to get behind him. You're going to have to lean behind him. And if you were in his camp before, great. If you weren't, you better jump into it now, because he's the guy that's going to take you to where you want to go. You are still square in the middle of everything, where you want to be. But now it's about stacking up dubs before conference play starts.